Okay, that's all the housekeeping. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Michael Ginian from Australian National University, Canberra. A uh, great friend and mentor. I can say he's one of the founding fathers of meta science and evolution of biology and ecology. And I came across his work around 20 years ago. That makes me feel a bit old and uh, maybe Michael too. Uh, he was conducting many important meta analyses on natural selection as well as textual selection. That was a great idea. Yeah. But also, I think this bit I was really attracted. He was doing a lot of um, fast large scale studies on publication bias and other type of biases, such as time lag biases. And also, he was probably the first people to working out the average effect size and the statistical power of the field of ecology and evolution. So, Michael's work not only inspired my own work, but subsequent meta scientific movements in ecology and evolution. So it is not incorrect to say his earlier work was one of the path to this, you know, forming this great organization, so team. Today he will share his meta scientist journey so far. Please, Michael, over to you. Thanks, Shinichi. Uh, and let me just first see if I can get the technology right and get the screen share to work. Uh, uh, can you see a full slide there? Yep, that's good. Okay, great. Um, I will get cracking then. Um, so the first thing is to thank the uh, Sorti conference organizers for this opportunity to talk with you today. And thanks to everyone who's uh, come along and is watching this live. And second thing is I've got so many uh, collaborators that I can't name and thank them all, but here are pictures of some of them and I'll try to single out a few during the talk too. And thanks to Shinichi for the introduction. I now feel very, very old, which hopefully can excuse the kind of talk I'm about to give. So when I was invited to give this talk, my initial response was, was no, because this, this isn't my field. And I genuinely felt that. But when I looked at my publications, I realized I actually have done a fair bit in this area. But in hindsight, my initial response, I think, shows how little importance we've historically placed on thinking about meta science, at least practicing scientists. And to be honest, in some ways, it still feels like a hobby to me personally. But that mindset is clearly changing in the wider community as this conference and the foundation of Sorty shows. So that's a little bit of background as to where I'm coming into this from. And so I have to warn you that my talk is a little bit light, light and fluffy, and I hope not too self-indulgent, but it might be. So my talk title was a cheap joke to make a minor point. So a drunkard's walk is an illustrative example of how random movements can generate predictable patterns. So if a drunk is sitting at a lamp, starts at a lamppost and they stagger random, randomly about in any direction, we can predict how far on average he or she will be from the lamppost after a given number of steps as a simple formula. So maybe, despite the fact that I've never really had any career plan as a meta, doing meta science, it's never been on my agenda, maybe I can still extract some kind of pattern uh, out of my own studies to tell a story. So to try to tell a story, in the first part of the talk, I'm simply going to describe my meta science experiences since starting my PhD way back in 1992. And it all really begins with negative or null results. So this made me interested in meta-analysis, effect sizes, statistical power, and publication bias. And in some ways, my focus here was on individual studies. How do you get a study published? What does an individual study look like? But the very notion of publication bias also made me think about its wider consequences. So what patterns in the data emerge when we look across the literature or over time? So in some kind of loose sense, um, trying to draw a distinction between the individual studies and the wider patterns. So let's go back to 1992. Several chapters of my PhD tested an idea that was then very sexy. So the argument was that deviations from perfect symmetry were a signal of lower quality. 
if, if this was the case, then symmetry could be used by, say, females to choose fitter males or pollinators to choose flowers with more nectar and so on. Very sexy idea. So I did studies where, for example, I manipulated leg band symmetry in zebra finches who uh, are or were alleged to prefer partners with red rather than green leg bands. So I created birds that either had two bands per leg that were symmetric or had three bands on one leg and one band on the other, asymmetric, and the bands were either all red or all green. And in another study, I worked on this beautiful damselfly in South Africa, my home country. Uh, and this damselfly signals by waving its colorful legs at females and males. So I painted the legs to make these leg patches either asymmetric or symmetric. So what did I find? Well, <laughs> I found absolutely no effect of symmetry. And this was my first experience publishing or trying to publish negative results. And I found it very hard. And I quickly realized that reviewers frowned upon negative results. They did not like them. So things, of course, are better today, but it still happens. So for example, with uh, one of my former PhD students, Rahina, who's now in Oxford, we produced several papers showing no detrimental effects of inbreeding in a fish. And reviewers seemed to query these results had we done things right. And these studies ended up in smaller journals. But when we got a sexy result that inbreeding reduces male sexual competitiveness and lowers their share of paternity, it sailed into a really good journal. So this is an anecdote, of course, but the tone of the reviewers' comments, and having seen many of them over the years, it's still telling as to the response to a negative result. So as a lab, we've started to learn, uh, because as a lab, we get a lot of negative results. My colleagues often joke about it. So for example, we did a study we were really excited about and it took seven years to do, it was massive. So we wanted to publish it somewhere fancy to reward ourselves for the effort. In brief, we evolved male fish with either, with either large or small genitalia. Don't ask me why. But against predictions, genital size had no detectable effect on their breeding success. Oops. And Amazingly, an editor at a top journal was honest enough to actually write and he said to us, hey, really cool study, but we don't publish negative results. So I had that in writing. So we tried elsewhere, but this time we, in a little trick, we added a reminder in the last paragraph all about publication bias. And perhaps it helped as the study was published somewhere we were happy with, Nature Communications. So we now regularly highlight publication bias in our discussions when we submit negative results to remind the reviewers what will happen if they reject the paper on that basis alone. <clears throat> now, of course, sometimes you get significant results, but they go in the wrong direction. They go against theory, and that could be even worse. This is a, on the screen. You can see an example there of a recent case. So my experience here is that reviewers become far more critical of very standard experimental techniques that usually they'd be happy with. The bar is suddenly raised higher. And again, more publication bias ensues. Now, the complete contrast is doing meta-analyses where I found the experience to be very different and also got to work with some great colleagues. You can see Julia and Kerry and uh, Jessica here. And I know Chris Lorty is in the audience as well. And we produced this handbook and that was a lot of fun. But what was interesting about meta-analysis is the mindset of the reviewers seemed to differ from those of primary studies. So I did my first meta-analysis in 2001 and they were then pretty rare in evolutionary biology. And if you look at the paper, it's now very dated. But you've got to recall at the time there was no handbook to guide me, there was no web of science, there was no PDFs, I was still getting current contents in a paper format as a booklet. So what I do recall though is that the results didn't seem to affect the likelihood of publication, that was not what the, the reviewers focused on. So unlike a primary study, a primary empirical study, non-significance wasn't a barrier. And the same is even true for results that counter, prediction, uh, counter predictions. So for example, it's often claimed that males are more physically variable than females or vary more in their personality, their IQ, intellectual ability, and so on. 
So Rose, uh, another founder of Sortie, recently led a meta-analysis looking at school grades of boys and girls. So she did find that boys were significantly more variable in their grades, but a key claim that the sex difference is greater in STEM subjects than other subjects, which some people could, would use to explain the stronger male bias in STEM careers, wasn't supported, quite the opposite. So again, a significant counter result didn't seem to unduly worry reviewers and affect the likelihood of publication. And finally, uh, Lauren and Dan have a meta-analysis that fingers crossed will hopefully soon be in press. I really like this study showing that you can readily publish a null result that is counter to predictions in a top journal. So what Lauren found is no evidence in animals that males are more variable in their behavior than females countering this idea of greater vari variability in, in men than women, which is then translated back into being part of our evolutionary heritage. So I find this difference between meta-analysis and primary studies rather silly. I mean, think about it. Why do reviewers care so much about the significance of individual studies, but then they'll happily accept the outcome of a meta-analysis that is essentially just the amalgamation of these studies? That's weird. So if you've never done a meta-analysis, and I'm hoping that a lot of the people watching this are, are young scientists at the beginning of their career, I really encourage you to do one because it has a lot of effects on your brain. Not all of them necessarily good, but it has them. For example, it makes you think about the strength of effects and not p-values. You suddenly realize p equals 0.09 and p equals 0.04 are essentially indistinguishable if you've got the same sample size. The effect size is more or less the same and the confidence intervals overlap massively. You also realize how underpowered our studies are. So my, stud my students always groan when I drone on that their sample sizes are well above average and that we should emphasize them, stick it in the abstract, because I think it's another trick. Well, at least I hope it is to boost the likelihood of publishing a negative result. Um, and meta-analysis has also made me dislike writing discussions. Why? Because I can't really take individual studies seriously anymore. And that includes my own. Given low power, we need lots of studies to see the truth. But that said, there is a challenge here. So if, uh, if, if there was a czar, a czar of science, should she be calling for many smaller studies or a few larger studies? What can we learn from underpowered studies? I personally think meta-analysis is the only hope we have because we can't really increase our sample sizes because of logistic constraints. But I always recall this quote from my favorite book review. I'll read it. The pious hope that by combining numerous little turds of variously tainted data, one can obtain a valuable result. But in fact, the outcome is merely a larger than average pile of shit. So this, <laughs> that little summary begs the question, how many turds are we dealing with? Is everything shit? So I, I looked at this a little bit in my small corner of evolutionary biology back in 2001. I was unemployed in Panama and library studies were a cheap way to get data. So I turned to the literature as my study site. And I was very fortunate to meet um, Anders who was visiting Panama at the time. And he suggested that I use my free time to survey the literature. So we looked at statistical power in behavioral ecology to start. And we concluded it was very low. Now I'm not gonna defend the exact way we did the analysis. Remember these were simpler times, but I suspect the conclusion still holds even now. I don't see sample sizes surging up. Power is still low. And then of course, if you've got low power, how can you be getting so many significant results in our field? And the short answer seems to be publication bias. So we did surveys looking at funnel plots and we showed that when studies have small sample sizes, they were more likely to be studies reporting significant results. Small sample size and non-significance, you don't get a publication. But at least back then, you could, I still have examples where you could publish a correlation with N equals eight if P was less than 0.05. And 
We also showed a pattern of smaller effect sizes being published later, the so-called decline effect. So fields start with starting with strong results, and then over time, they were becoming weaker. Non-significant findings were becoming more common. So one explanation, and there are many, is that this is due to publication bias and significant studies being published sooner. So I don't want to particularly defend the robustness of this meta-analysis. It might not be true. I actually think someone should go and check and re redo this study. There's loads more data now. Um, and I'll talk about it more in a bit. But the pattern itself was disconcerting. This is, it made me start thinking what the scientific literature is really like. So after all these, that burst of studies with Anders, I was now thinking more about what publication bias is doing to science and to scientists. So if we reward publications and significant results are published sooner, then what? It's a little bit of a tangent, but in late 2005, Hirsch published a very influential paper because it introduced the H index that now rules our lives. We all know it. We know what other people's H indices are. Many people are obsessed with it. And when I was looking back at the papers I'd done for this talk, I was genuinely uh, surprised, genuinely, that by early 2006, Clint Kelly and I had already published a little data set on the H index in evolution and ecology, looking at the reviewers of uh, the editorial boards of journals. So in brief, we noted that H is pretty highly correlated with the number of publications and that it's not that easy to correct for academic age. We also noted that at least in our data set, women had fewer papers than men. So they ended up with a lower H index. So all of this suggested way back then that H should be used with caution. It isn't an independent measure of quality performance. In many ways, it's simply another uh, index of productivity. And I was amused to reread the final sentence, which is about M, which is the attempt to correct the H index for age. And M of one is seen as being average. And we noted that Bill Hamilton, E.O. Wilson, Bob Trivers, Richard Dawkins, and Stephen Jay Gould would all be considered below average by this criteria. And you can make of that what you will. So let's go back to the drunkard's walk. So pee hacking is the final drink before the bar closes. So I really only became aware how widespread the fetish for significance was in 2012, and perhaps more importantly, how to look for evidence of its damaging effect on the scientific literature. So I was invited to give, uh, uh, give a talk at a conference in Santa Barbara, just dumb luck. That year had been interviewed by a young journalist, Joe Nalira. Now He was at the time the next Malcolm Gladwell, working for The New Yorker. And I then got to see my own words quoted back to me in this prestigious uh, North American magazine. This was my five minutes of mainstream press fame. My mom was thrilled, and so was I, to be honest. And Jonah was invited to the conference. I was really excited to meet him. But a few weeks before the conference, he was, in modern parlance, cancelled for falsifying quotes. It was a really big media story at the time. If you want to know more about it, I can strongly recommend uh, John Ronson's book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. And Carl Zimmer also wrote an excellent piece about how Jonah's case caused him to reevaluate the role of hype in selling science. He was talking about science journalism, but a lot of what he wrote applies to how people write their discussions as well. And it's worth trying to hunt down that piece by Carl Zimmer. So the conference was off to an interesting start. But when I arrived, it was a complete mind trip. So <laughs> it was so bizarre. So the participants spanned the range from brilliant scientists like Brian Nosek, who the following year in 2013 launched the Center for Open Science, and Leif Nelson, who you will know from p-hacking fame, on the one hand, to some very odd parapsychologists who, as far as I could tell, were talking complete gibberish. And I wasn't sure if I had jet lag or had fallen through the rabbit hole in uh, Wonderland, but hands down, best meeting ever. It was but bizarre. 
So one paper that I brought to the meeting was this one. Now at the time, almost no one had cited it. It was just buried away in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. So in brief, the authors looked for evidence that people are doing things to increase the likelihood of getting a significant result. And they did this by looking at p-values in two little ranges. So the details don't matter, but what they did is they surveyed three multidisciplinary journals. Their third one was Prop B. And they found that there were more observed p-values just below, say, 0.05 than were predicted based on their null model. That was intriguing to me, but I couldn't quite, the null model was a bit hard to work out, to be honest. Uh, my maths isn't good enough. But then Leif Nelson on the left gave this brilliant talk at the conference. I was so impressed. And he talked partly about what he called the researcher's degree of freedom, which was a term from a paper published the year before, and how easy it is to redo your analyses to get P below 0.05. And even better for me, he described the null distribution of p-values given different effect sizes, and he called these p-curves. And suddenly things were much clearer to me. So researcher degrees of freedom that he talked about at that conference was a prelude to this brilliant marketing term. He is in a business school after all, p-hacking. So p-hacking, as far as I know, only appeared in print in a publication in 2014, in this publication that's gone on to become a classic. And in it, Leaf and his colleagues uh, linked it to p-curves. So we know that p-value dependent publication bias comes in two forms. So the first is the classic file drawer effect. If you get non-significance, you stick the study in a drawer, forget about it, and try again with a new study. P-hacking, in contrast, is a catch-all term for the many ways that researchers try to get their p-value below the magic 0.05 level, rather than stick the study in the file drawer. So how do you p-hack? Well, here are two options. You could conduct an analysis during your experiment and use the p-value to decide whether to continue or stop, stop if it's significant. Awful idea. But in fact, many welfare and ethics committees will still recommend this practice to reduce the number of animals used in an experiment. Or you could record multiple varial variables, analyze them all, and then present the ones that just get below 0.05. Don't want to push your luck, but you could just pick some of those. So you can imagine in this case, the blue and orange dots are the various effect sizes for all the different response variables. So if you picked one at random per study, the mean effect would be around 0.05 in your meta-analysis. But if researchers are mainly reporting significant results and all else being equal, that's a greater effect size, then the mean sneaks up to be uh, 0.07. That's a problem. So we, we all know, ideally, we should take our data, decide how to analyze it, lock it in, and then look at the p-value for the factor of interest. Otherwise, if we keep doing analyses, we can easily find some that will get us below 0.05. Now, I know this is really basic stuff. As I said, I'm not really deep into the stats of uh, meta-science, but it's worth pointing out the basics because I genuinely remained amazed how many colleagues still do this. And not just colleagues, I do it. I still catch myself doing it. It is so easy to self-deceive. So at the conference, Leaf explained how to use p-curves to detect p-hacking and other publication bias. And he illustrated it with some fun examples from the social psychology literature. And I immediately thought, oh, this would be great to do the same in biology to raise awareness of this problem of um, p-hacking. But it would be a lot of work and I'm kind of lazy. So it took a few years, but then in 2014, uh, Megan arrived in the lab and she was prepared to take on the challenge. And she also very strategically roped in some computer lads, Luke and Rob, who like playing with code. So Leaf had explained that the p-curve is simply the frequency distribution of p-values from a set of studies. So on the left graph, the black line shows the p-curve you get when there is no effect, an effect size of zero. All p-values are equally likely. 
On the right, in contrast, in black, is the p-curve when there is a real non-zero effect. If you've got a real effect and lots of p-values, what you should see is more very small p-values and fewer larger values. So if you want to look for the file drawer effect, it should be detectable by looking either side of 0.05 and seeing a drop in frequency shown by the red lines. That would tell you that there's some selective reporting or file drawer effect. But the cool bit is that if we look only below 0.05, we can identify p-hacking. In brief, we'll see a rise in p-values as we get close to 0.05. So the null distribution in black, it's always flat, or it's going from left to right down in that slope. It never goes up. So more values to the right than to the left is a, is a danger sign that there's something amiss. So we can simply count the number of studies in two bins, say 0.04 to 0.045 and 0.045 to 0.05. And if there are more values closer to 0.05 than 0.04, it looks like people are p-hacking. So let's go and see how naughty we've all been. So we can use, we use text mining to extract p-values from either the results or abstracts of open access papers randomly took one p-value per paper, classified studies by discipline. Here's what we found. So the fields with a red symbol had significantly more than 50% of p-values closer to 0.05 than 0.04. So across all fields, meta-analysis weight by number of studies, there was clear evidence for p-hacking. One little catch though, this is data mining. We don't know where these p-values came from. Were they from interesting questions in the study or just very side issues? And that matters if we want to see if the p-curve itself suggests a true non-zero effect, i.e. is the black line a curve rather than a flat line? So we, well, Megan, uh, manually re-extracted the relevant p-values from papers that have been used in a whole series of meta-analyses in our field. In other words, these primary studies were all asking the same focal question that was because it was being meta-analyzed. So for example, does multiple mating increase female fitness? Something like that. And again, we found evidence for p-hacking, that's the 0.03 result. So that little upward bump below 0.05 was still there. But in addition, we also found that the curve does have that, it's not a flat line, the distribution of p-values, it does show the curve, which is consistent with a true non-zero effect, so-called evidential value. So despite the p-hacking, there's still evidence from these p-curves for this subset of studies that we looked at, of questions in evolutionary biology, that the true effect is non-zero. So it's not all just uh, one in 20 results. There is something going on in these set of studies. So finally, I had a fun idea. Well, it amused me because I'm easily amused. So Pierre, Milan and Megan tested for what we ended up calling reverse p-hacking. So we were asking, this was the silly question, are people so obsessed with p-values that when needs must, they will actually fail to report a non-significant, uh, they will fail to report a significant result or they will reanalyze their data to get a non-significant result rather than a significant one. So you might ask, why would anyone do this? Why would you want non-significance? Well, think of a drug experiment where the subjects are randomly assigned to two groups. So you have the treatment group and the control group. So your aim here is to ensure through randomization that all else is equal between the two groups. Now, imagine if you know that body size affects survival. You want to ensure body size is similar in both groups. So you check because body size is a confounding variable and other obvious confounders might be sex, age, body condition, whatever. Because if body size differs between the two groups, then how do you distinguish the effect of the drug from that of body size? Yes, I know you put it in a stats model, but remember once upon a time, people mainly did t-tests. So we can test for reverse p-hacking by looking if there are too few cases of a significant difference in confounding variables between experimental groups under representation of significant results. 
So if we go back, the null is a flat curve. Remember, subjects are randomly assigned, so the true effect is zero. So if the selective reporting, we will see the curve on the right. In other words, significant results are not being reported. And if people are actually working somehow, maybe they remove an, an outlier, they could try and turn P as less than 0.05 into non-significant. So we might see a little bump immediately above 0.05. So we looked at papers in three journals. We first asked if fewer than 5% of such tests found a significant difference by comparing these, um, well, I'll come to them in a second. And second, we asked if there was a bump in the distribution. So there were more values closer to 0.05 than 0.15. And what did we find? Well, we found evidence for selective reporting favoring non-significance. So this was morbidly fascinating to me. People really are under-reporting non-significant results when it suits them. But there was no evidence for the strict reverse p-hacking. So what lessons uh, have I learned, if anything, at this stage? Well, I'd say that we can, we can document the problems. Clearly, I, you know, 20 years ago, I was mucking around with this, and many people in other fields have done the same. So maybe we know enough already, perhaps. And maybe the, the real issue now is coming up with solutions. And of course, that's going to require evidence they work. So what we really need now is policy and exper experiments actually manipulating how people practice science so that we have an evidence base for good policy. So that's the end of the data-driven part of my talk and the rest is all opinion. And I know it was supposed to be half an hour and I think there's probably another 15 minutes to go. Um, do you wanna come back on Shinichi for a second and should we just take a two minute break? Yeah, yeah, you are on the track. Right. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, yeah, well, I know, um, I, I know what it's like when you're having to sit to listen to a, a talk. It gets boring after a while. So if you've tuned out on me, which is perfectly understandable, why don't you stand up for two minutes, shake your legs, and we'll start again. And I'll give you the second part of my talk where I just spout off opinions. Mike, I laughed about four times, so it's been good. You're easily amused. <laughs> All right. I was hoping I would have some uh, cockatoos to show everyone because they always come outside the window. But bizarrely, uh, I guess you should never work with animals. Uh, they have refused to show up today for the first time ever. They're usually banging at the window, pushing their faces against it, trying to get in. All right. Let's, um, let's carry on then. You can vanish again or stay if you want, whatever you like, Shinichi. So basically what I want to do is ask, what is sortie for? What's, what's it all about? And I want to hazard a guess as to why some of my senior colleagues are so grumpy about open science. Why do they always get the feeling that there's something about it they don't like? So open transparent science is sold in many ways. It's packaged because it, in many, many ways. But here are kind of three broad arguments that I keep seeing. And they are exposing fraudsters, increasing truthiness, and lowering mm. bias. So here are two men that you may or may not recognize. If you don't, I can tell you that they are convicted terrorists. And I think we can all agree it's a good thing that they were put in jail so they didn't kill innocent people. But why am I showing you these particular men? Why these two? And it's because they illustrate the price of paranoia or the price of hypervigilance. Because they are the shoe bombers. That's the shoe bomber and his accomplice. And the question you then have to ask yourself is a simple economic one. Are these subsequent hundreds of millions of dollars and God knows how many human hours of labor spent scanning, stews, uh, scanning shoes at airports worth it? Now the answer obviously depends on how many people plan to put bombs in their shoes now and what will happen if we fail to detect them. So the equivalent issue for us as scientists is how much fraud is there out there? And I think we've got to be careful here because I reckon that fields probably differ a lot. 
Now, if you do flashy studies on humans, you can have a really big payoff. You get to write a bestseller about the advantages of a neat desk or the psychology of left and right wingers. Now, evolutionary studies don't have quite the same public appeal, in my view. But ultimately, it is an empirical question that, we, that it would be nice to know the answer to as to how much fraud there is. But I personally don't think busting fraudsters is the best way to sell transparency to the wider community. Now that said, I do want to give a shout out to support whistleblowers like Josephine, Frederick, Tim, Graham, Ben and Sandra and Dom, who did a PhD associated with my lab, who exposed the microplastics fraud paper that was published in Science. And I really don't like the way they are maligned by some people and, you know, these, these bitchy comments that are made about them, because I think their intentions are laudable. How can you take offense at someone wanting to ensure that the literature is truthful? And I don't believe they are driven by malice. Quite the contrary, so I applaud them. But there is, there is a catch. The truth is they are vigilantes. Now, that's not me being hyperbolic, because by definition, trying to get justice yourself when there's no functioning legal system. That is the definition of a vigilante. And I actually note with amusement the title of this article on uh, Uri Simonson, published in a big, a big magazine, The Atlantic, has vigilante in the title. So Uri is the co-author of the p-hacking paper and the person who busts the fraudster Dirk Smeesters and several others by looking at patterns in their data. So vigilantes can be great. Of course, think about Batman, the ultimate vigilante, but it's easy to go astray. Think about Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. So I just mentioned that in passing and we can discuss it afterwards perhaps. So, so much for fraud. Next thing, what about to use Stephen Colbert's phrase, truthiness? So the Argentinian writer Jorge Borges wrote a very, very short, short story. And there's the story in full. I don't expect you to read it. What he does in that short story is he describes an empire where map making was valued, but it attained such perfection that the map became so detailed that it had to be the size of the empire itself. And sometimes I have this feeling in the back of my mind, but a focus on documenting everything. We should videotape every behavioral trial, report the exact day and hour in which we used Web of Science to do our search and so on, is akin to this obsession with recording every detail. So remember science, one view of science is that it's elegant lies. It's simplification to explain, not just recapitulating the world. And I also think it's about trust to some extent. Complete cynicism is fatal. And that might be why some older researchers get grumpy when they're told they have to document anything. They are thinking, can't you just trust me to be honest? That's why I got into the game. And after all, most of us, we hope, are in science because we celebrate facts. We don't like just believing in things. But the irony of that celebrating facts and not just believing is that we have to have a certain amount of faith in each other. So to push a point a little bit, uh, my, uh, my favorite president of my home country, South Africa, Nelson Mandela, if he can trust his former oppressors, can't we trust each other to some sensible degree too and not get wracked by paranoia? So truthiness uh, uh, and this exhaustive documentation is not, for me at least, a convincing way to sell sorty. So that leaves reducing bias. And this, for me, I think is the, the key. So, for example, pre-registration forces you to think about self-deception. It alerts you to the risk of, say, p-hacking or collecting your data not blind to the treatment group of your subjects. And I'm not alone in thinking this. So here's a survey finding that uh, Uri tweeted out actually last week in which it's reported that 79% of researchers said that clarifying ideas before running a study was the top benefit of pre-registration. And of course, registered reports are the next step in that because they're not only reducing self-deception, they're actually rewarding you for trying to uh, reduce your own biases. 
And it's pretty clear that registered reports are going to become a key element in improving science. Now, I know they have their critics. I, I would love people to explain to me more about why people don't like these registered reports, because I personally don't see why there would be any opposition to them. So I hope you'll support a sortie initiative to lobby for registered reports. And if nothing else, just think about the equity issue. Research is really expensive. So increased certainty of publication matters a lot to people in countries that where there's not particularly large amounts of funding to do science. So to even the playing field a little bit between rich and poor countries, you can help improve science in those countries by lobbying for registered reports. So that for me is the main way to sell sortie. Uh, I mean, we, uh, yeah, the, this reducing um, personal bias. All right, yeah, sorry, I'm just backtrack a second. So, yeah, reducing personal bias. If you think about it, it we're living in this world now with very heightened social se sensitivities. We're all aware of the dangers of unconscious bias. So few people, for example, want to be racist or sexist. We, we want and we seek advice on how to be better and avoid uh, having these attitudes. And in the same way, very few scientists want to cheat. So the tools that can make us aware of how to act ethically are going to make a big difference, I think. So I'm going to end with three final thoughts, and they're really partly here just to stimulate a bit of discussion in the question and answer session. So the first question or thought is, does any big society thrive without a legitimate, legitimate police force? So that's a picture from my home country of South Africa. Uh, last week, the former president was jailed for contempt of court. And this week, this morning, I was reading about it. There are riots all over the country. I personally am really glad there is a police force. I don't want to defund the police in this case. Enforcing rules alongside encouraging good behavior is usually essential to maintain a functioning society. So think about it. Even sports, sports, you know, grown adults chasing around little bits of leather have courts of arbitration. But where is the equivalent for science? I mean, surely science is more important. OK, well, at least as important as football. Why don't we have the equivalent structures? The second thing is I think it's worth noting that scientists are often not great politicians. So this Max Weber is a famous German sociologist, and he made the point that politics is often not based entirely on rationality. That's why politicians and lawyers are good at it. That's what makes them politicians. They're good at arguing on their feet and shifting quickly, and they know how to get things moving in the right direction. Scientists, on the other hand, are obsessed with evidence, constantly thinking about the counterexamples. So I think we are going to need to work with policy wonks, not, not science policy wonks, just any policy wonks who have general rules of thumb of how to proceed if we want to change science for the better. Finally, the, almost done, hang in there. I think utilitarian arguments are the best way to think about the current state of science. So Jeremy Bentham is a philosopher who had his head preserved, hence that grotesque picture, who championed the view that we should maximize pleasure, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And this nowadays is essentially cost benefit analysis. So for science, the currency we might be trying to maximize is truth or explanatory or predictive power, however you view science. If so, all the arguments against open, reproducible, transparent science, all that SORTI stands for, the arguments against it should be inspected very closely because they probably fall into three types. The first is that they are arguments that can actually be phrased, rephrased as utility arguments. And if that's the case, let's make sure we rephrase them and we debate the estimates of the costs and the benefits to decide whether something is or isn't worth doing. The second possibility is that these are simply arguments designed to protect those with power. If that's the case, we should challenge them. The third possibility is that people are well-meaning. They're not trying to preserve power. They're just unthinkingly invoking tradition and norms. If so, we have to point out this is just past prejudice. And we have to recast those arguments in terms of utility, and then we can have a debate. The one caveat about utilitarianism is you have to remember that it's all about maximizing the global 
happiness, not necessarily the distribution of it. And that can come at a high cost for any individual sacrificed along the way. So it's not a route straight off to individual justice and protection of individual rights. So do we want that? And at this point, somewhat surprisingly, I'm basically saying maybe we need lawyers and philosophers in sortie too. And I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for listening. Jamie, um, thanking uh, Michael, and that, yeah, that was fantastic, and a lot to think about. Simon, so, uh, please continue putting the, your question in Q and A, uh, and I will probably do the first twelve minutes and uh, move on to mixer. So, first question, uh, please do upvoting as well. Yeah, more questions coming in. So, from Fiona Fidler. <clears throat> Do you think as a staff, not p values, but instead of a confidence interval, the base factor be less susceptible to hacking? What do you think, Michael? Um, <laughs> I don't really understand Bayesian <laughs> stats. I don't think I'm alone there. Um, no, I, look, I, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but basically, I mean, anything that has a potential threshold in it is, is people are just going to they will inevitably start focusing on a new norm. It's very hard to stop people making a rule of thumb. So I don't know if it's an instant solution, even that. I think the real solution is, is simply the design of the study. You design the study, yeah. everyone agrees it's well designed, the sample size is adequate, you do the study and what happens happens. To me, that's the only way. Whenever you are worried about the results of the study, we're in trouble. It's, I think it's as simple as that. Maybe I'm simple-minded, but that's the bottom line for me. Yeah, I agree, Michael. So next one from Chris, and I thought about this as well. Fascinating and inspiring, and he's referring to this. And you, you know, early on, early on the talk, you talk about, talked about you know, synthesis papers are subject to different biases. Um, why do you think that? And is there like what kind of, you know, is there a reason for this? You thought about this? I, I haven't really, but I, I, I guess probably part of it is that historically reviews have always been treated differently. Uh, if you want me to be deeply cynical, uh, if you've ever had to review a, a paper for biological reviews, it's probably 120 pages. You don't have the same level of uh, scrutiny uh, as you do with a conventional empirical paper. That might be a little bit of it, but it's it's... But I think more generally, it's simply that everyone accepts that a review is a well-meaning attempt to summarize things and that it's not, um, that there's less vested interest in the outcome, perhaps, which doesn't mean you couldn't do a review where you very where you cherry pick. Of course you could. Um, but I think that might be part of it. It's simply that people go into anything that's review based, believing that the people doing it are simply trying to bring things together. With less of a vested, but of course, you know, an individual empirical study, you have a vested interest. That's why your sexy study with a small p value gets sent off to nature and science, or used to be. Uh, that's that's how we all do it, or most of us. Yeah, do. yeah, thank you very much. I think, yeah, I think there was a related question. I can't find it now, but beforehand, I think Chris was asking the whether people uh, looked at the p-value of the meta-analysis rather than p-hacking of the, actually, the empirical study. Do you know about this? No. So, uh, uh, what, can you say that again? It, uh, it sounds a little bit bad, Shinichi. Uh, sorry. Um, have anybody looked at like a distribution of p-values in synthesis meta-analysis? Uh, well, yes, I guess that study with um, with the head at L study in plus biology that for the the second there was the day there was the text mining part, and then the second bit was the meta analysis. So for each meta analysis, we were looking at the distribution of p values, and there we were able to show there was p hacking because there was a little bump up below 0.05, but the overall distribution had that curved shape as opposed to the flat shape of no true effect. So that suggested there was evident, so-called evidential value that there was on average a non-zero effect. Um, 
So yep, so people have people have looked at it, but it's not widely. I don't think it's widely reported as a curve. You know, I guess it's the information is there in a funnel plot, perhaps sometimes. Okay, so this question, I'm interested in your opinion as well. I've heard about the policing idea in the past, and I agree. But whose responsibility do you think it would be to uh, begin a policing for in science? Yeah. Well, the great thing about raising questions is you don't have to have the answers. <laughs> um, I, it's very tricky because, of course, I mean, let's think about the police. So I let's take the example. I said I am very pleased there is a police force in South Africa right now because there are people rioting on the side of a, a corrupt president. However, if you had taken me back to South Africa in uh, 1990, uh, that was not a good police force. That was a police force that abused its power, uh, protected a small proportion of the population who happened to have a white skin. So police forces are always uh, scary because who will police the police? We all know this. And again, I, you know, I think this is where I, at the end I mentioned lawyers and philosophers and policy people because they obviously have experience with how to, how to regulate and keep things stable. And I, I just think it's a huge challenge. I don't know. But if, but, it, but as I say, I, I thought of it this morning, if sports can do this, surely we can do a better job. You know, someone, mm -hmm. someone punches someone in uh, Australian rules football on a Friday night. By Monday morning, they're in court and getting a ban for six matches. And they're not banned for life, which is another interesting thing. You know, we set the bar very high here. If you get bust for having made up some data, it's, a, it's one shot and you're out. And that is pretty harsh to not allow for redemption, I think. Um, again, I, it'll sound corny, but I just point to Nelson Mandela. He managed to live alongside his former captors and he didn't forget, but he forgave. And it allowed people to move forward. And so I sometimes think part of the problem might be that for people of my generation, we've probably done so many bad things in our papers over the years that with close scrutiny, everyone is going to look rather dirty. And that may be one, maybe, maybe I just have a guilty conscience, but uh, maybe that is one problem, is the, the ability to wipe the slate clean or the ability to um, have sanction for a mistake and then the opportunity uh, to continue to participate in science. Uh, very interesting point. And Sarah has sort of a similar question, but I'd be very much interested in, in hearing your opinion. So you mentioned the idea of police force in publishing. What would that look like? And how could it be possible without a continuing issue and the bias we currently see in the publishing industry? And Fiona kind of replied with peer review meant to be our police force, question mark, and journalist, question mark. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I suppose. yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, again, I, I think Fiona's right. Peer, peer review is supposed to be our police force. But like how many people, okay, let's, let's go back to the analogy. How many police forces are volunteers? <laughs> That's pretty unusual. It's a, it's a serious job and it should go with responsibility, accountability and so on. And we don't necessarily have that for peer review. It's a very loose structure science at the moment, and that has wonderful benefits to it. it. It allows for the creativity that older people love. And let's just, we'll work, the attitude is, look, we'll work this out in the end. There'll be some mistakes, but ultimately we're going forward. And if you look at the progress of science and technology, don't get too panicked by these cases of fraud or p-hacking or whatever else it might be, because the net movement is, uh, you know, forward. Um, but yeah, that's, that's not a good answer. It's a mealy mouthed answer, I know. But, yeah. but it's because I genuinely don't know how we would do it. But it does require independence. It, it requires like an internal investigation unit in a police department. They're sealed off from the rest of the police department, right? The rest of the police department hate them. I've watched enough Hollywood and uh, British uh, crime shows to know that. But they're there for a reason. But you need very clear structures in place to allow them to work so that they're not abused by, say, people just wanting to bring down other people and that they are fair minded and that they're not just uh, legalistic, that they're not just catching people on technicalities, but genuinely going after corruption, for example, or, mis or serious misconduct. It can, okay. it, so, can, it can be done. Yeah. So I might 
make this the last question, and I, there's a lot more questions actually. It generates lots, lots of interesting questions. I might defer that to the mixer, but the final question from Dom, uh, Dom Roche. Beyond the cutting fraud stuff, I think he's going to challenge your second point. Careful documentation and reporting of studies, e.g. filming the trials and sharing them has benefit in terms of the use. Isn't this and of itself a reason to encourage require more comprehensive reporting and sharing? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes and no. <laughs> so yes, if your goal is to exactly replicate that study. But, I mean, you know, we all know that the difficulties of replication in biology, because it's not the same animals in the same world, and it's everything's changed in the interim. Um, so yes, it does increase the reproducibility. And obviously, you want good methods sections. And you want to record a trial to so people can see how it's done. But do we need to record every trial? I think there's there's other approaches that just uh, allow a little bit more trust in our colleagues. That's that's all I'd say. But I, I don't dispute that the good documentation is good. But again, it does come at a price. I'll go back to the shoe bomber example. There's a there's a cost benefit analysis to be done here, and I think that it's easy to go to extremes. That's what happens with people. They get their bee in their bonnet about something, and they go down that path. And that has a price. Just, I mean, just think about it. One guy puts a silly bomb that probably would have killed him and injured some people in front of him on the plane. I don't know, but let's say. And after that, we have 20 years of endless queues at airports. Was it worth it? Okay, very interesting opinion. So I'm gonna stop here and we can keep um, our discussion in a informal setting. So we're going to move 